Welcome to this Rapid Revision video looking at Whitechapel. First we're going to be having a look at crime statistics and the organisation of police forces in Whitechapel. Firstly a bit of background about policing in the 1880s. By the 1880s every area of England had its own police force though these were not typically very joined up. Typically they were held accountable to a local watch committee rather than central government. London was the exception with the Metropolitan Police accountable to the Home Secretary directly. This control was jealously guarded. When the London County Council was formed in 1889, there were fears that left-wing and socialist councillors might have influence over the police, so attempts to have the LCC control the Met came to nothing. London's population had grown rapidly, and police manpower could not keep pace. In 1885, there were 13,319 officers, compared to 5 million Londoners. However, only about 10% of these 13,000-odd officers were available for duty at one time. Statistics like these can be very useful in this unit for following up other sources. We will now consider some of the uses of statistics for inquiries into Whitechapel's policing. So what do we mean by statistics? Statistics and figures say very little on their own, but when used to support or test other evidence, they can be very revealing. Let's have a look at an example. This image shows home office records for the average crime figures in the years 1875 to 79 compared to the year 1880. It lists various offences and whether or not there has been a rise or fall in recorded crimes. Here are some examples. Burglaries. These rose from 330 on average between 1875 and 79 to 425 in 1880. But why? Was there more of this crime or were more simply recorded instead of going unreported. Then we've got assaults. These fell from 902 on average between 1875 and 79 to 749 in 1880, a drop of 17.9%. But again, why? Were fewer reported? Or was London really a less violent place in 1880? Were police numbers a deterrent, succeeding in reducing violent crime? On their own, these statistics leave us with plenty of guesswork. But in 1878, there were 216 detectives in London, but by 1883, there were 294, quite a substantial increase. This suggests that in this period, there were more detectives working to record these crimes. Also, arrests by detectives rose from 13,000 to 18,000 over the same period. This could suggest that policing was improving over time, but also that more crimes were being reported. Perhaps this accounts for the overall drop in crime by 7% over this period. And if more are being reported, in terms of a greater percentage of those that are being committed, and yet we've got a drop, then probably it suggests that crime is going down. But again, statistics on their own leave us with a lot of guessing to do. Based on statistics alone, there is a strong suggestion that crime went down in the later 19th century. However, this too can be misleading. This is from Crime and Criminals of Victorian London by Adrian Gray, published in 2006. There were variations in statistical collection and an improving police force could lead to more arrests. Some activities became illegal that were not before as the state became more regulatory. However, despite the occasional scare, there is general consensus that the crime trend in England was downward. This was recognised by the Home Office at the time. This is from a Home Office memorandum in the 1880s. Population. The figures in the statistics are absolute figures of crime without regard to population, i.e. the figures do not assess the numbers of crimes against the size of the population. In the period of 34 years now under review, the population has increased about 50%. There has also been an unknown immigration from the countryside. Therefore, police statistics on their own cannot provide everything needed by historians to make judgments about trends in police work and crime. So if statistics are so misleading, what else can we do? The media is one of the easiest ways of monitoring what actually happened as its accounts are dated and detailed. However, these two must be treated with caution. Publications like the Illustrated Police News might sound like official news outlets linked to the police, but this was misleading. Their stories were written to maximise sales, often at the expense of truthful reporting. These sensationalist penny dreadfuls were comparable to the tabloid newspapers of today or possibly even worse. So negative towards the police were these papers that others appeared in response that offered a more favourable view of the police. The Police Review was one such journal. 
the Evening Argus, in October 1888, interviewed the superintendent of Bethnal Green, James Keating. He claimed that there had been only one serious incident in his district at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders. But of course, when we check the statistics, it's different. Police records show that there were actually four stabbings, four violent robberies and two serious assaults on women. It seems that James Keating simply chose not to re report these. These re records must be used with caution as well, and ideally in combination with other sources like police station records. So if you can combine the statistics with the stories in the newspapers, you might be getting closer to the truth. Other sources are available. Individual police stations kept records of crimes. These can be useful, but again, on their own, they can be misleading. For example, records for officers in Middlesbrough suggest that officers were assaulted at least twice every year, but this can't be the case realistically. The records only record the instances of assaults, not the thousands of times police work was carried out with no assault taking place. Instead, more detail can be taken from descriptions on documents such as freedom licenses. These were release papers from when a prisoner is released with more detail of the offence committed. And court records. Accused criminals from Whitechapel were tried at the Central Criminal Court, known as the Old Bailey, and statements from witnesses were recorded. And also memoirs. Some police officers, and indeed some criminals, wrote accounts of their lives based upon memories and personal experiences. To sell the books, they could be somewhat vivid and exaggerated, but they also contain real details from eyewitness accounts. Being based on memory needn't be a drawback. Important events often are well remembered. Think about your own life. The most important events in it, you probably very clearly remember. Here's an example of the Old Bailey records. Here we have a, a witness statement by someone called Conrad Jaeger. I was at a public house in Fieldgate Street on Saturday 22nd of February. I left the house at 12 o'clock at night. As I was coming out, these three men and Peter Conch fell on me. S. Cucken laid a hold of me and Bartle struck me with a key on the head and then I became insensible, which means unconscious. But here is the response by Patrick Garrity, a police officer numbered H159. On this night, I saw the row outside the public house. I was It was partly quashed when I got up. There was another constable there. I saw Bartles go into his own house. I also saw Jaeger there. We separated them and then we got to the other end of the street where there was another row and there we found it necessary to apprehend five. So we got two slightly different reports here, one from the accused man and one from the arresting police officer and somewhere between them we can probably find the truth. But who are you more likely to believe when it comes to these two sources? As you can see, Statistics alone cannot possibly give us the really human details and colour that these other sources and reports by the people who are actually there can give us. We're going to consider more now how the police was organised in the 1880s, starting with the Criminal Investigation Department. The Metropolitan Police focused on the prevention of crime, but in 1842 a Specialist Investigation Department was created. However, the role of this department, detection versus prevention of crime, was unclear and it was understaffed. A police corruption scandal in 1877 led to a barrister called Howard Vincent setting up the Criminal Investigation Department, better known as CID, in 1878. It was staffed by 218 officers with a clear brief to detect crimes. However, the detection of crime did not immediately improve. After all, Jack the Ripper was never caught, for example, and some corruption remained. So what was the leadership of the police like at this time? This is where Sir Charles Warren comes in. In 1886, the government turned to Sir Charles Warren, a former military general, to become the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. This was in the wake of some serious protests and demonstrations against the government, and the appointment of a hardline military man went against Robert Peel's original philosophy that the police were not simply uniformed government agents like the army. In November 1887, Warren called in the army and the police to control protesters in Trafalgar Square, resulting in one death and several injuries. This became known as Bloody Sunday. This led to an increasing distrust of the police in poorer areas, with people feeling that the police were really there for the middle classes and not to help them. Here's one report by Sir Charles Warren himself, published in Murray's magazine in November 1888. This is right at the end of the Jack the Ripper killings and roughly a year after Bloody Sunday. Successive governments have not made a stand against the more noisy section of people representing a small minority and have allowed many riots to occur 
with, that have brought terrorism to peaceful and law-abiding citizens. Leading opposition politicians opposed to the present government have used these riots to their own advantage by shamefully supporting the mob. Such statements actually didn't do Sir Charles Warren many favours. Warren was criticised from all sides for appearing to enjoy the results of Bloody Sunday. The Jack the Ripper murders in 1888 provided the government with the excuse to dismiss Warren. Our final points in summary then. The Metropolitan Police of the 1880s were relatively understaffed with only about 1,300 officers on duty at any one time compared to a population of some 5 million people. Crime statistics can be used to understand trends in crime over the period and each division of the Met kept detailed records. However, on their own these can be misleading. A drop in crime can be explained by more effective policing working as a deterrent, but also a rise in crime can indicate more effective policing leading to more arrests. Contemporary newspapers can provide more detailed reports of crimes with interviews from officers and witnesses. However, these were often sensationalist and inaccurate. Not letting the truth get in the way of a good story was very common. The use of court records, freedom licenses and memoirs can add more detailed accounts of crime. However, these are most useful when used alongside statistics to help explain the background to the numbers. There was reorganisation of detectives in the later 19th century. CID, that's the Criminal Investigation Department, was established in 1878. However, the appointment of Sir Charles Warren as Met Police Commissioner and the events of Bloody Sunday in November 1887 undermined the trust of the poor in the police, making police work more difficult, particularly in poor areas like Whitechapel. In our next video, we're going to be looking at the context of Whitechapel. But until then, that's the end of this rapid revision video. I'm going to say thanks very much for watching. And if it has been useful and interesting to you, please do consider liking the video and possibly even subscribing to the channel. So what do you think of the best sources? Statistics, memoirs or something else? Let me know in the comments. Goodbye.